and Mr. Willis Brown, Mr. Dana Mesner, will then um, offer a little significant monologue about each stop. It is those stops that you will be asked to evaluate. The survey is rather self-explanatory. Um, for those of you who do not have writing utensils, there are some pens um, on the tables. You will also be provided with maps. Mr. Maisner? Go ahead, Mr. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, this one. And today's tour will have two parts. And what we're going to do is a loop around the historic boundaries as close as we can be. And one of the big changes that will be very obvious is on the north side where 670 is now. The boundaries as identified in the 1938 dispatch article go to the railroad, which as you know when 670 was put in all that area was changed. And another significant change will be where the freeway is with 71 and Columbus State and Fort Hayes. So some of it is altered that way. And so after we make that preliminary loop, which we will go up to St. Clair to Leonard, and we go around Fort Hayes, down Cleveland to Broad Street, Broad Street to Taylor, Taylor up to Mount Vernon, and we go over to Mar uh, Woodland, then Woodland to Maryland, Maryland, then we take Leonard. Then we'll come into the neighborhood, and then we're going to go to six locations. And then we will get off the bus at each one of these six and have approximately 15 minutes or so and make some discussion and if there's a question or two uh, then we can answer those and then you can write comments and fill out the form if you would for each one of those locations it'd probably be easier if you did it while we're at that location and then the uh, the stops will the first one will be on long street and then we will progress in a circuitous route and end up back here and so the majority of the tour will be uh, discussion about these locations. And these six locations will identify a building, but it's also about a larger subject that is of interest to what uh, we're here about. It's in this position today. The first one uh, came uh, in, in uh, May 17, Brown versus the Board of Education, 1956. And uh, when that happened, it meant that African Americans now, in the process of desegregation, can now spend their monies and go other places. We didn't understand that impact. That instead of spending everything, so segregation had an economic engine. When desegregation occurred, socially it was a great thing, it felt good, but economically it was devastating to the African American community. All the money went out. All the monies that, 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 that built the Lincoln Theater, the Pythian Theater, all that money started to dissipate. So therefore the local grocery stores didn't have the revenue coming in to hire uh, Miss Johnson's son, because now they're shopping somewhere else. Then people started moving out when things got better for them, or one of their children you know, received their, their degrees and moved on. Um, then the neighborhood was still intact when that took place and it was rolling and still going like like a battleship taking blows and torpedoes but still floating then what happened the next big uh incident was was that of um we, we like to say the highway that, that very late 50s early 60s when the highways act was passed to build these highways a lot of cities received a lot of money to do this and um, that physically made a barrier and and cut uh, the Bronzeville off from downtown. It broke up families, and and, and to show you the power, um, from Spring Street to Broad Street is the only part of 71 that's below grade. And the reason why that is is that the the wealthy that lived up and down Broad Street, when the 50s, when they were coming in here, they fought the federal government says, "Listen, you will not come in here and build a highway to block our view of downtown." and they were able to win and that's why the only part that's below grade is from spring street because they had the reason why it came to spring wasn't so that we can have a view of downtown it was that how the, the grade of the highway has to be for safety that it has to go down and it comes back up 
Now, why is it that systematically across every single city in the United States that urban renewal led to the, to the elimination of these neighborhoods uh, in African American communities? Uh, well, the only way that the literature can describe this in urban studies and urban geography is the fact that the, the, the business interest wanted to have wealthy African Americans participate in mainstream banking, mainstream real estate, mainstream uh, groceries, mainstream department stores. These African American economic enclaves were very wealthy, as witnessed by the architecture that you see up and down uh, on, on uh, Mount Long Street and the businesses that are on Mount Vernon. Um, and so the only way it can be des described is actually a systematic uh, effort to be able to disrupt these communities, to be able to get the, the African American capital to bring it into mainstream. So unfortunately, it's a it's a it's a blemish in American history, but it's institutional racism that led to the destruction of African American economic enclaves. So how do we get that money? Well, let's dis disrupt that, and that's what took place. And so it was a systematic. Uh, Dr. Walker stated there was a systematic way to to get the economic engine, that that money, that resource. So that's why I'm saying with urban renewal, uh, it, it had a real. Grade, as well as desegregation on the um, e economic impact of the community, social aspect of it also. Mm -hmm. So this is what so this is where um, we, again we're on our uh, northern border. When Lowendick tore down all that, you see the Mount Vernon Plaza and all of that. You can stand on Mount Vernon and see all the way up into Milo Grogan. There was nothing. It was all level. And um, you know, just to show you the, the, the impact that had. And then as a result of that, the rippling effect was people moved to the south end, people moved up into to South Linden. That's how those areas became populated, was during that, that, that great migration or elimination or whatever term you want to use, a movement of, 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 of people from this area. We were just saying, we were commenting, looking at the map, mm -hmm. looking at the highway, and I was describing how the highway really cuts off Bronzeville from the yeah. from the, the northern neighborhoods up here, which are across the highway, would be the American edition. Right. And it was brought. It was the, the comment was made. Yeah, but before the highway was here, the railroads were here. Right. But it wasn't just one railroad track. This was a whole railroad yard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so actually, this would have created employment for people living in Bronzeville. Right. Instead of being a complete, completely cutting people off right. from the area, it would have been a, an employment generator. Whereas now, with the highway being there, it really leads this to be. Being kind of bleak area, and they all. This is like the, the beginning of the century, at the very early like 1890s. The early settlements in this area was over, right by, right around the, the railroad tracks, and then they moved. And Champion became a main artery to move, and that's why as things got better or, or and, and populations increased, African Americans moved south and then settled in the Blackberry Pass. That's how the Blackberry Pass became the Blackberry Pass. It, it was the next major settlement prior to that of around the railroad tracks on Champion and um, around in that area. So the oldest settlements is right there, but Atchison and, and uh, Champion are uh, butting up to the railroad. Again, servicing the yard. We just passed there. Servicing the, the, the railroad yard. The building on the corner that Charles torn down two weeks ago was owned by the city in the land bank. That building they tore down was in better condition than the Lincoln Theater that they have saved. Now, that building, several people were very upset, like they were with Centenary and the one on 21st and Long. So what we're saying, the city owns the Edna. We want you to do what you have to do to save it. It's the last one we have through here. The, the Edna was built by Mr. Farley. Uh, Mrs. Moreau's grandfather, and he lived on Hamilton, and he named it Edna after his wife, Edna Frawley. And we like to always boast about Long Street, is that very few places in the country that we can pick out buildings that the men built, but they named it after their wives to honor the women, because during the 20s and the 30s, the women were the economic managers of all the monies. And they, they used to meet, and we heard this from Mrs. Garrett, who, who, who used to own the Hotel Sinclair. They used to meet at the Crystal Slipper, which is across from the Lincoln. 
on Sundays and have tea and discuss what projects need help. And if the husband said we are going to the moon, they were saying, well, we're going to get the money to build a spaceship to take you to the moon. So the women were very honored and revered back in those days because the, the building that our office that Mrs. Lake owns here, the, the one that with the clay tile roofs, is called the Teresa. Uh, Mr. Jackson built that and named after his wife, Teresa Jackson. So and we have the Bernadine, which is further down, by, from Dr. Jones, Mrs. Uh, Bernadine Jones owned that. So again, this is the history. Dr. Method built this build. I mean, well, renovated this building and was his hospital here. And so what we're saying is that this corner, just a few years ago, was an intact corner. It had all the original buildings from the barber shop that was here. The Charles was there. We had the Colony Club that was here. So which means when you have a building stand, like we say with the Edna, you can do something with a building that's still standing. But the time to come out of the ground now is going to be long because it takes more to pull something out of the ground than it is to renovate that and do something with it. It's, it's when these houses are, are scheduled to be torn down, how can you find out about it? Because I've had a problem finding out and they tell me once they're scheduled to be torn down, you cannot change it. Right, and, and, and that, that's, that's been a big issue with us. So this is why we are hoping to put something together to have in place that if you if that's gonna take place, that they should come to a body outside of that of just NEAC. Because what happens with NEAC- NEAC is Near East Area Commission. Near East Area Commission. And when they go to NEAC, NEAC either just they get the information behind the time or there's not much. NEAC is an advisory body to the, to the city, so they can either listen to them or not. So this is why forming a stronger community-based uh, entity that when you have a building, not that all buildings have to be saved, but you want to have some input. I say, if you're going to tear it down, what are we going to do? Here's our option. Why don't we do deconstruction? Right. Why don't we have, what's the plan that's going to go there in its place? All that is what we need to have discussions on when we have that. So, Ready, so now, many of you, some of you have heard of the Garden Manor. There is some confusion on the actual original true Garden Manor. This is the Garden Manor. There is the owner at 20th and Long, the Eberly I think it's how you said early, early mansion, is saying that is the Garden Manor. From the Ohio State News, 1950-51, we have description of this as the Garden Manor. And there is a resident in our neighborhood, Mrs. Thurman, who lives on 20th, who owned the Garden Manor at that time. Still alive, yeah, in her 80s. And, and a picture of her was in that showing that when she took ownership and converted it to the, get, the, to the garden man, took over and did some renovations and so forth. And, and that was because of the, at that time, a lot of musicians came to town for forum, but they couldn't stay downtown. So this area had not only a lot of residents, but we had businesses that were hotels, guest homes, and that kind of stuff. So this is what it was. But you can see Miami was the street um, during the 30s that people moved up and into. Um, if they lived in a smaller vision and, and the economics changed, they all were trying to get to, to this side of town. So this, that's you see that the, the, the quality of houses, the caliber uh, of the houses um, are larger. Between Broad and Long, the houses were a little bit bigger and they went down by size. But this was the street that was always a, a wonderful street. Even today, they have their own um, uh, Miami Avenue Association that's been around for a while and uh, they've done some things to maintain the, 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 the caliber, the quality, and they're working on that, on, on um, improving the street. Now, the reason why we want to have some historical accuracy here is because in this predominantly black neighborhood, it's, it's no secret that the various black entertainers, when they came and performed in the various theaters, the Lincoln and the other ones, were not able to stay downtown. They even performed downtown, the various hotels. They came to this neighborhood. Let me give you a list of some of the hotels from the Ohio State News in 1951. Some of you probably know of these that were in this neighborhood. They were on Lexington, 
There was a great number on Monroe. There were a few on Long Street. There were a few on Mount Vernon. And there was this one. Hotel Norfolk, the Tourist Hotel, Draper's Hotel, Ward Hotel, Brownlee Tourist Home, Hawkins Tourist Home, Hotel Nassau, Hotel Mosley, Hotel Carlton, Hotel Cooper, and the Garden Manor. Those were for the black community. Now, we don't mind people saying the current, or I now have a place I'm calling the Garden Manor, but historically, that was the Garden Manor in this black community, and that was one of the high-end locations. And the list of the entertainers that stayed there is, is unbelievable. From the Duke Ellen and Mrs. Thurman can give you the list of them. And, and, and I used to walk up this, this block and stay there. So it, it, again, we're showing not only the, the building, again, one of that should be kept or should be ma maintained or, pr or protected because of that history about it. And it just gives you an idea of, of the diversity that the neighborhood facilitated at that time. Now, the, our brick streets that are under this. If you can look down here, you can see this street is perfectly bold. <laughs> These streets were put in in the, in the mid-1880s, like 1879, 1850s, 18, late 1800s with the brick streets. We have beautiful brick streets up under here that will make the brick streets of German Village look like nothing because this was the upper class, so they built the, the structure here a little bit better. We want to keep, we want them to remove some of the, the blacktop, not on the main streets like Long Street, but on the streets, because that slows the traffic down and it adds value to the neighborhood. And the third are, well, you don't see them here because they changed some of the curve. We have sandstone curves that we want to maintain. And that's another area. So those three things are the, are the fabric of this community, as well as the housing stock. I'm a community organizer with Columbus Housing Justice. We've been working with residents in Point Extra Village. Um, myself, Willis, Rita, and about 10 other people have put together a history festival to happen at Beatty Rec, right, on the, right here on the edge of Point Dexter, commemorating it's the 70th anniversary of FDR's visit and sort of inauguration of Point Dexter. And Point Dexter is a really amazing history. Before it was Point Dexter, it was the Blackberry Patch, which was a uh, hub of Southern black culture in Columbus. A lot of people migrated into the Blackberry Patch. So the festival is going to be really great. There's going to be a stage show, puppets, workshops. Um, Anna Bishop, who's a local historian, wrote a history book about Point Dexter. So that'll be free for all for anyone who comes. We're going to be distributing that book. So really encourage everybody to come out for that. Um, and again, it's part of uh, changing the dialogue around this area to focus on the value, the talents, and the history instead of um, using negative words at the city level to talk about Point Dexter, to talk about the neighborhood. And I have flyers, so if people want to make sure they get there and have the right information, here they are. Yes. Now, to give you the, 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 the deeper history of Point Dexter Village, uh, Mr. Uh, James Madison, Madison, right? Madison. Madison. Um, he was one of the original cabinet members of the Bronzeville cabinet where Reverend Scarborough was the first mayor elected in 1937 and was inaugurated um, um, March 13, 1937. Uh, uh, yeah, and their mission, they had eight cabinet members. Each one was given a task. He was housing and recreation. Mr. Madison was also a track star at East. He w went to OSU in 1930, and when he was a senior in 34, getting his degree, Jesse Owens was his roommate and came in in 1934. And, and he tells us stories about that. He is now 98 years old, soon to be 90 on December 10th, and we went to visit him. And we, have a, a, we did a video of him, and he was the first, he was, his task was to eliminate the Blackberry Pass for one, for a couple of reasons. One, that it was overcrowded and the sanitary conditions were awful. And he said, we have to do something about that. And he then organized, uh, when he became, uh, when, when they were elected, and he had to take that on. He had to meet with the mayor, federal, re federal government representatives, and they were able to secure the fund because at that time the city was doing a lot of housing projects. And then what they did was to come up with this plan. And he was the one that initiated it, went through the development, the construction, and the, the, the ribbon cutting when they opened it on October 12, 1940.
Yes. Well, that's when, when, they, when President they Roosevelt, Roosevelt came, came through. Right. And the, 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 the question came in, but how did they get this name Poindexter? We asked Mr. Madison, how did that happen? He said there was a competition of what it should be named. And Mr. Tyler was the one who suggested Poindexter, and he won. There was a prize attached to this. Twenty-five dollars. He won, <laughs> and, and they took the name, and that's how it was named Poindexter. So, you know, he still is very much involved with um, his 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 thoughts. And when we talked with him, his key was recreation, and he also was a manager, assistant manager at the Brady Recreation, and then became manager for a short while. His whole focus was: we must not only have beautiful buildings. But we must also have recreation. If we don't have recreation for the youth, they're going to get into trouble. And when we met with him last, this year, that was his still cry. And he then went on to work for the federal government doing different things in recreation. But he said we must take care of the youth. And, and that's why he, he went and, and forced Beatty to have activities. But on top of that, he was the one that facilitated the building of Maryland Pool. Oh, wait a minute, wow. wait a minute. Yeah. No, actually, that happened before. That was okay. the, 20, that, the before. He had he played. He was important in that, stressing the need for Maryland Pool and whatnot. Maryland Pool was built in '29. We'll we'll get to that, uh -huh. but that was an important part of the recreation right. that he stressed. He was with the National Recreation Association mm -hmm. and traveled around the country promoting recreation in the black community. And the other the other key thing, the reason why we stopped right yeah. here is. He was the first resident manager of Poindexter and lived in apartment A, 1220 right here. Arthur Place. And he had, right here. And his, he, he had his, his wife and two daughters. And both of the daughters are still alive. One is a doctor out in Vegas, and the other one, uh, I forgot what her profession is, in um, Maryland. And they were raised here. So this is significant. So. Now that you heard the history, now the question is, boom, OSU is right here, east. You see, when they laid this out, it was laid out to be a secondary uh, facility, I mean, home, where it, it's to mimic coming out of a single family residence. So a lot of people, and some of us are here today, who lived in Poindexter, Mr. Rita Smith is one of them, and some others, that when, they, when you moved here, it wasn't you know, second class. It was built as a first class place, but to mimic what it would be like being in your own place. That's why you see, as a housing uh, de uh, development, the space that you have in between them. And, and inside, it's kind of small because people didn't have a whole lot of stuff like they have today. So, you know, what we're saying, so because of that, it has a lot of land. And it is the first one registered in the federal government as, they have a number designated 001. Now, during, night, during that time of 19, the late 30s, mid 30s to the 40s, a lot of these cities were doing this. So when this came online, some in New York came online. So that, that year, several cities came online with housing the, um, projects. This was the first one that was registered. So that, that people get the, you know, the distinction. But if you look in the registry of housing projects, this is the first one. And, and there, there are photographs of President Roosevelt in his open car, and you'll see some of those next week. And what, what happened on October 12, 1940, this was almost completed. It was right before the presidential election. Ohio, like always, could go Democratic or Republican. It was Columbus Day, big parade. So President Roosevelt came in Union train station. They had his motorcade come down this ramp. The cars shot off the railroad train, and they came out Mount Vernon. They came all the way down Mount Vernon. Then they came through Poindexter, and it was lined with people, people waving flags, all kinds of things. There are a few photographs, kind of grainy, but we have some. And Mount Vernon School was included. Right. Yeah. They came through there, the kids were all around. All kinds of things. And then we are also inundated with a lot of ex-offenders. But what do we do with them? We just flush them down in toilet, mm -hmm. send them on the river? No. We give them a skill. Some of them are carpenters. Some of them, but you have to begin to give them credit, you know, let them be cred, you know, credited or given some type of certification. So if you're not putting those things in place, then you're right. We can save the bricks and mortar 
but you're going to always have that element of crime and despair. And, and what hurts Dana and I, that we, we out here a lot and we see, to look into the eyes of some of the youth here is an awful sight to see. To see, a, 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 look at some of that and see nothing but emptiness is awful. And I, I grew up in Harlem, and I know what that look is like. So we have to get together, not only save the bricks and mortar, but we have to begin to knit back the fabric of this community by instituting and beginning to deal with those things that deal with the social and economic opportunity. For so they want to expand. This is in the way of expansion. So what we have to do is sit down at the table and discuss what can be done. And we are saying that yes, at some point, some of this may have to go, some of it may not, but let us be part of that determination because some of it must stay. Like for example, if we keep so many units or whatever, they need to be renovated to make them bigger, more accommodating. These things are built like, like tanks. They're well built. And that's why they sustain their time. Even now, they still look good. And, and, and the fact that, you know, if anything has to stay, this unit has to stay just because of Mr. Madison. But anyway. The building in question, but the, the thing to be also keep in mind is all the way down Taylor to University Hospital at Clifton, you saw all those houses on this side, many of them vacant, are at risk because Taylor is a direct route from the freeway 670 to University Hospital East. As we all know, OSU Hospital, the main campus, built that off-ramp 315 to have a direct shot to the emergency room. Riverside Hospital has a direct shot off the freeway. It's just a matter of time till they do the same thing right here. So we're saying we need to identify this building and have some kind of game plan. If you have to do something where the intersection here gets pinched, we got to have a conversation. This building is very unusual. We don't know all its history, but you can tell looking at that thing, there is no other building around that looks like that. I don't, there's not a building on High Street that looks like that. And, and what's also significant about this here, and, and to give you some, some point about what Dana said, straight shot, this is part of the whole negotiations when we sit down and talk with them. You just can't come in and just do one thing. Well, let's put together resources, state, federal, city monies, and developers to come in and do the, 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 the entrance way to the hospital. Let us save this. Now look at this, this is a, a, again, the whole block. These townhouses right here is it, really unique and beautiful. And, and again, there's another set of townhouses on this side that's behind this building that needs to be preserved because it, it keeps the character of the block. Remember I said, now we're coming into the commercial zone, but this is that transition. And again, Taylor Avenue being what it is, a main thoroughfare from the highway to the inner, inner of, the, of the community, it needs to have some work done to it. So that's what we're showing here of how we get more residential when you go east and we get more commercial when you go west. Until 1933. The first Columbus Public Pool was constructed here in 1929 as the center of east side social and recreation activities. It was the home to many black athletes who brought pride and distinction to themselves and to the city. And, so, and also we talked about Mr. Madison. He also stated that the Lazarus family gave $10,000 to facilitate this pool and to maintain it. And, um, and he made it clear that that was a big issue because they wanted to maintain it so that um, we would have something over here that African Americans can go to. And, and um, he, he made it clear that, that Lazarus did give $10,000. Again, 10000 back then was a lot of money. About the fate of Blackburn Pool at 18th and Main, guess what they want to do? They want to tear it out and fill it in. This pool has been closed. All the outdoor pools are at risk because there are not monies. There are, I believe, four indoor pools that the city parks and recs maintain. Are we going to lose this one? That's the question. We got to, we got to have a discussion. And its significance, it's the first public pool, outdoor pool. And what's funny about this is the fact about, you know, we're talking about activities for the youth and getting into crime. Well, this, this summer we had 90 degree temperature. All these youth had no pool to go to. And I remember bringing my kids to this pool and being there. And I'm telling you, the, the staff that ran this pool, they were the best. Did it have any issues here? That's right there.
<laughs> yes. But the other significant told me how to swim here. Right. That's but the other right. significance of this pool was after it was built, it was the only pool that black children in the city of Columbus could attend could swim in. Um, and we called it the ink hole. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> It was called the ink, ink hole. Oh, ink hole. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 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 ink in, in. like ink, because it was from black for folks. black folks. And that's what the nickname was for it. But it was the only pool. You would have, you know, you had pools all over the city. But this was the only place you and could And it was swim. the first one. Okay. Is all that's left of what they called the Avenue, Mount Vernon. Excuse me. And from what I've heard, talking to Randy Black oh, at the city historic, oh, no, very alone. these buildings, these buildings are not protected. Oh. Anything could happen to these buildings; they could be torn down. So we want to save these. These. This, that's the last piece left. There's nothing on Long Street anymore. It's just a random building. This block and almost the half has to be seriously looked at. Okay, this block and the half block. Right, right. So that's why I said building row. And this is something that Columbus Landmarks is aware of, historic and Columbus development is aware of. But, okay, everybody's aware of it. Now, what are we going to do to protect it? And if anybody has any questions, that's fine. If not, that's the tour. And we can go down and have lunch. What? If they, if, they, if, they, if they invest in this neighborhood like they do, if you get how you change the system, yeah, but there's nobody, you know, but we always left out though. None of these businesses know the All right, we gotta go. Right, not y'all don't live down here or own business down here. Nobody knows that. You know, Wills lives on Monroe, there was Wall Street. My point is that no, my like point is that nobody like nobody over here we don't even know what's going on. They over there they don't know what's because going on. Barry, Barry, Barry. <laughs>I mean, this is probably one of the first festivals in a long time that's being held at Poindexter. <laughs> How's the turnout? What's what? What do you think of the turnout? Oh, we have a nice turnout, and people are uh, is all inside, and people are coming. We have an array of activities. We have workshops talking about the history. We have workshops talking about Poindexter. Um, we have uh, people coming in, uh, telling oral history about the area, not only Poindexter. See, it was the Bronzeville neighborhood. Right, Point Dexter, like one front. Oh. Oh. Oh, sorry, that was a flame in my ear. <laughs> All right, sorry. To, go yeah, ahead. the 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 Point Dexter is just one piece of the Bronzeville neighborhood. At that time, in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, this area was was a real self-sustaining community, and Point Dexter was just one piece of a greater Bronzeville neighborhood. Which at that time, the boundaries were. Um, uh, Broad Street was the southern boundary, the Pennsylvania Railroad, which is now 670, was the northern boundary, the west boundary was uh, Cleveland Avenue, the east boundary was Woodland. So today what's left is Broad Street to the south, I-670 to the north, Taylor Avenue to the east, and Jefferson Avenue to the west. So it's about one square mile now, and we have about 16,000 people um, here today. So you, you hope to save it? Well, we, we hope to, 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 to have a, a voice at the table to discuss what the outcome will be. And that's what's important. We will hope to save, if not all of it, some of it. Because we don't know what the pressures are, but we like to be at the table to discuss uh, what, this, what, what we are doing uh, with this building. Because it's, it's more than bricks and mortar. There are people that live here, there are people that want to live here, people that have connections with not only to Poindexter but to this neighborhood for the last three or four generations, and they want to be here. And yet you have those who don't want to be here. So we're saying that we just need to be at the table to discuss this, and the residents are now getting organized, and we hope that the, the festival will, will facilitate that you, you need to organize and take um, your destiny into your own hands. You cannot always expect everyone from the outside to have your interests at hand. We need to uh, do things ourselves. And as president of the Civic Association, that's what we are about, trying to improve the social and economic opportunities for the residents 
of this community. They've done some renovations, yeah, obviously, but, but, and, but, but, but this is it. And that's why it's spaced out, because it was built to mimic a residential. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't meant to be putting you in, in like cans and sardines yeah. in a can. Which it turned, and unfortunately. Then, turned and, what, and what now means that it becomes an asset to OSU East. All this land with poor mm -hmm. folks in it, mm -hmm. that's almost like a rat in a cheese factory. We're going to yeah. take it all. Yeah. So yeah. what we want to do is say, listen, we need to work on this because you just can't get rid of all of this. Mm -hmm. And yes, it may have some problems now, but that's, that, that, need, that can be fixed. Problems can but this is the original okay. layout. Cool. That's why, and, and that's one thing that, that people should see that they think of Poindex is some, you know, dilapidated place. But what, what the people in Columbus need to see, look at the condition, look at that, they're beautiful. <laughs> From your house, trash that you're gonna throw, clean trash, water bottle, my water bottle, and I can make you a sculpture or a wall piece out of it. So, are you enjoying yourself here? Yes, I'm enjoying it. Very, it's very good. <laughs> Bringing back memories, and since they mentioned that they're gonna uh, take the pond next to the village out, I'm so glad that you're doing this mm -hmm. because it's uh, something that uh, gives us everlasting memories. What we're doing today, we can. This, this is something I'm so glad to do. That's great. I'm so glad you're here. Yes. Um, and you said that you had reconnected with some of, some of your old friends. Yes, I connected with two or three here that was here when I got here in town. Uh -huh. But it's not many left. So it's been 50, it's been 60 years ago now. And when I came here from West Virginia, this was, I thought this was middle income to live here. Uh -huh. It was beautiful and it was a village because when it was before integration, Negroes, we didn't have a decent place to live as a group. So when I came here, this was, uh, uh, it was beautiful. But coming from West Virginia here, I thought this was middle income living here. But, and it, it's the people that living here then, everybody worked. See, this is the only difference there now than then, Every apartment was filled, but you had a man, wife, and children living in it. Mm -hmm. uh, some worked at defense construction for the federal government, post office, North American, and this was a village. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just so sorry that they got to, they will be taking it out, but uh, it was uh, the best thing that ever happened to us Negroes at that time was building this village. Can you talk about what you were doing when you first came here and, and what your purpose was and you know, what your mission was? Well, I came here because I was looking for a job mm -hmm. in West Virginia. I didn't intend to go into the coal mine. I was only 16 anyway. And mm -hmm. so I came here and my relatives had moved here to Columbus. And this is how I was invited to come over to Pondexter Village by some friends. Wow. And I got lost over here too. Close to <laughs> down home, no houses, two houses look alike. When I came over here, I went out to buy some something. And when I came back, I looked around, I said, where did I come out of? And this was, it was just so beautiful. And uh, it still is a beautiful place to, that we have here. Mm -hmm. Back then, I wasn't preaching then. I was in the bar business, I was working for the federal government. And then I uh, went into the monument business, which I'm still in the monument business. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, was the first merchant to move into the Mount Vernon Plaza. First merchant. I was doing three things at one time. And then I decided I wanted to build my own building. And I bought the corner at 20th and Mount Vernon and built the Stewart's Food Mart in Delhi. And this is, uh, I still own that property. I just lease out the store, but I still own it. And I decided in the last few years I would retire and spend the rest of my time working with our young people, mentoring our young people. Um, what kinds of things do you do with young people? Well, Franklin County Juvenile Court sends them to me rather than put them in jail. When they give them community service, so they send them to me. Okay. I take them to church, mentor them. We do very, I'm supposed to be working, we do very little work though because they need to be mentored. And um, that's what I enjoy doing. And some of the, then I have a Buckeye Military Academy. <clears throat> That's a program where we have our young people in military uniforms. Uh -huh. 
and some of our young people as we went into the military as lieutenants now. So we are working now uh, putting some more programs together, especially with our young people because I was in the newspaper with Champion Middle School last Sunday when they did that piece. I was part of it. And we have to do something to get those grades back up. You know, that is a brand new school, but it is the lowest rated school in the state of Ohio, Chapman Middle School. Now, what I did also, uh, the old Champion School that they just torn down, mm -hmm. I and New Eastern Commission gentlemen, we went to the Board of Education and Parks and Recreation and asked them for that land. They agreed to let us put a park, which would, should be right uh, over here. It will be a park on that lot. And when they tear down Pond Extra Village, we are asking for some of the bricks to build them a memorial on that park in honor of Pond Extra Village, the Reverend Pond Extra. See, we just can't take this out without leaving something in his memory. So we will put some bricks and hopefully we can get some contractors to donate the service of building that memorial. And I would also on Pond Extra on the lot would put a a, a black wall of fame on that, and we could put plaques on all the Negroes, I'd say Negro, from within the Columbus area, not just the East End, that have accomplished some things for our young people to see. Mm -hmm. See, this is what we have to do, is let our young people know whose backs they're standing on, what came before them. We have a lot of black history out here, but nobody knows about it. Right. But Can if you we, talk about some of, oh, the, some of the structural issues in well, the history? The thing that did this, most people don't want to realize or talk about it, was integration came. When integration came, see, before integration, this East End was a city within a city for us. We couldn't live anywhere else. Now, you could be doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, you lived out here. You had professional people that was written because there was no property to buy up. Now, when integration came, we wanted to buy a house. We wanted to buy our own property, so what did we do? We left the East End. We went to Greenway, that was the first that opened up. Uh, Woodland, Greenway, out through there. We could buy homes there, then we went to Shepherd. That was the second that opened up for Negro. I went to Kelton Mulberry. We were the first family that moved over there. But we didn't realize that was that village leaving. What did we leave? Basically, we left the projects. Before we left, you had working people mixed in with the unworking, the uh, mothers without a father, with the, without a man in the house. But we kept our feet on the kids too. They were just like our kids. But when integration came, we left. We forgot to look back. See, that's today. Even all of our churches out here. They don't have an outreach center. See, they have no outreach center. So we have, as the Bible say, the sins of the fathers go down to the third, fourth generation. What are those sins out here? It's abandonment. Now the third, fourth generation, we're looking at that fourth generation today of young people that don't have a father. Now some of the young people that I deal with, they ask me, Reverend Stewart, will you be my grandfather? I never had one. Well, you got one now, but it's going to be forever. Yeah. But we have to come back into the neighborhood now. Who we, us men that left here 20, 30 years ago, let's come back, work with Champion School, work with the mothers. Spank them if they were wrong, and I could spank theirs if they were wrong. Even if you walk down the street, we've seen them doing wrong. We took care of one another's children. Have things changed from that time? Uh, dramatically, yes. It has. The younger ones, young children are having babies. They don't know. And I told them when they started letting the 18 years old in here, there would be a difference. There would be a great difference. They needed to be home. What do you think about the fact that the, that has been part of this complex for a long time? The senior citizen building? It's going to come down. Yeah, well, they've already tore ours down mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a tragic to me because that senior citizen building, they really had a good thing going on. Because uh, one of the presidents up there, the tenant council of the senior citizen building, I forget her name, it's been so long ago, 
I had went up there and talked to her, and they had an area there on the first floor where they could entertain. It was really nice. They could have dinners. It was really nice. And they had parties. Everything was really nice up there. Okay. That's all I need to know. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. And you're one of the organizers of this program? Yes, I was. I attended one of the early meetings when we were trying to decide what could we do to bring uh, awareness to the residents as well as to the greater community, how important Poindexter Village has been to this community. And it's been, what, a year and a half in the making. But for myself as an elder, it's been exciting to see the young people work so hard to bring this to fruition. It's, it's marvelous to see the turnout, the enthusiasm and the, the passion and the young children willing to um, participate and perform. But also they've been very excited about learning about some of the history of this community. What is the one thing the most you want that they don't know about this area, that people don't know about this area? What is? Well, I myself resided when I was first married here at Champion and Hawthorne Avenue, and I had my children here. And we, as a community and a society, have forgotten to care for to care about each other. This was that old adage: "It takes a village to raise a child." Well, this was truly a, a fine example of what that meant. Uh, the entire community cared about each other. Um, I, my children could play out front and we could feel safe. And uh, the, the management that was here, Mr. Colwell, he, they cared about you as a tenant, you as a, a resident. Um, the entire community cared about each other. There was just a total different value. And that's what we want our young people to know that times can be tough because we lived here because times were a little tough at that at that point in our history. But we could come through it, we could survive it, and we could do it together. And that's what we want our young people to know today. You can do it together and you can survive together. What happened, everybody instead of pointing the finger and, and uh, shunning them, it became a, okay, this has happened, uh, we were sorry that it was happened, and the, as a community, we tried to, uh, to undergird or to help to turn that kid uh, uh, around and not just uh, uh, mark them off as, as uh, useless and label them. The other thing that is happening in with our uh, school system and within the, that has changed the uh, neighborhood here, there used to be certain requirements. Anybody, yes. even mm -hmm. if you were, mm -hmm. uh, had a fixed income, because originally when they first started building, and there was that real uh, dispute because uh, between Poindexter and the government subsidized housing in, in uh, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania being the first one in this country. Mm -hmm. And I think they said that Columbus is by it just is. a few months. Yes. But well, what Columbus they, is the first. Yeah, it's first. Yes. first. Yes. Yes. And that's why yes. I hate to hear about them, because we're, we're, yeah. we're yeah. 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 And they're talking about uh, yeah. Yeah. destroying yeah. history. Yeah. 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 But what they but what they were doing it to try to assist those that were coming home after World War II mm -hmm. to make sure they had housing. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of military mm -hmm. families that were living in uh, Point Extra Village mm -hmm. also. But you could not, just because you had certain criteria, you had to go through the managers uh -huh. were so different. Mm -hmm. The managers, they knew who their families were. Right. They monitored their activities in the village. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody couldn't uh, 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 move in there. One of my, one of our uh, buy-ins when we first came, my father was a, a self-employed painter and contractor, did interior and exterior decorating. And my father painted the first completed projects here. And as a painter, there was a, a level of trade-off, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but that helped us to, for us to secure it. But there were standards. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, I don't know. I, if you I know that name keeps coming up. <laughs> Everybody's talking about Mr. Caldwell. He wants to come down. Okay. okay. 
And then when he walked up and down the alleys, he wasn't the nicest person, in my opinion. No, he wasn't. But uh, they looked at your yard. They looked at what was going on around. And if it was out of order, they called you into the office. Like at Tobias said, our, our parents were uh, were adults when they had children. They weren't children having children. Another level where we have to take some responsible. Uh, okay. Go ahead. See, you know what? I always just try to control everybody that's going on. But she's been talking more than anybody else. Well, uh, 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 that's what you want to say. You have family. And food over there. Back when in the day. When it was a community, it, it it was it was our life. It was yeah, our lifestyle, right. you yeah, know. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I came from. Mm -hmm. And and when what we came from was good, right. was good. And and there's been a lot of points brought here. And the one thing is, you have children raising children, mm -hmm. and you have children that don't haven't been taught. Right. These are the parents. They haven't been taught. Mm -hmm. They they don't understand that we we would all go to uh, Bible school mm -hmm. and uh, to I remember the, the bus that come yeah. out and would pick yeah. us up and take us uh, to Bible school and and things like that. But we have to go back. Just go. This was your life. Mm -hmm. This was instilled in mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. because I would venture to say all of us around this table right now still go. Oh, Why? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yes. we were mm -hmm. taught that as children. Mm -hmm. See, and it grows up in you. You know, uh, what did the scripture say? Uh, train up, up a bring up a child in the, in the way she can go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. But see, these children are not brought up like that now, so they don't have anything to depart from. Okay. And so you know, the, the other thing too is with the church was it didn't matter whether you were Methodist, Baptist, right, Catholic, right. Holiness, whatever. Right. Everybody went to church. Went to church. Everybody went to Sunday yeah. school. Everybody yeah. went to church. Basically. Everybody. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you went to church. Go ahead. Everybody Over in this village? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, they did. Oh, well, and it was a